been over 15 years since we lost him, but it is newly devastating to learn that there are so many others going through the same pain and loss that my family did without the support that they were promised when they decided to serve. Hi, everybody. I'm David Ignatius, a columnist for The Washington Post. I'm pleased to welcome you to a special conversation today about veterans issues, especially focusing on health care. We have uh, to begin our discussion, Senator Tom Tillis, a Republican from North Carolina, a member of the Veterans Affairs Committee in the Senate, who has worked hard across the aisle to focus on key health care issues affecting veterans especially the issue of burn pits, something that may not be familiar to all of our viewers, but I hope by the end of our program, it will be. So Senator Tillis, uh, welcome to our discussion. It's great to have you with us. Maybe you could begin by just explaining what these burn pits were in Iraq and Afghanistan, what was put in them, and what are the health dangers? Well, first, David, I, I want to thank the Washington Post for helping us increase awareness on what we're talking about. We, we, I want to talk, and I hope that we get in the discussion about some of the past exposures, like the uh, toxic exposures down at Camp Lejeune, something I started working on back when I was in the State House as Speaker. But when I got up here and I saw the uh, the data is very compelling that we had a number of operators in the Middle East who, after uh, they moved into an area as they're securing the area. The, uh, the standard operating procedure was to burn computers, disk drives, equipment uh, before they left to make sure it wasn't salvageable. And now we know that those uh, various materials have toxic substances that we think are related to diseases that men and women uh, in Afghanistan and throughout the Middle East could have been exposed to. I wrote an op-ed with Senator Klobuchar basically saying that this could be this generation's Agent Orange. We need to get ahead of it. We need to accelerate care options for people currently actively serving and, and those who are in veteran status. We wanna get ahead of this. We don't wanna have the years long struggle to make the presumptions right so that they can get the health care they deserve. Senator, we'll talk in a minute about how we might get ahead of the problem as you suggest. But first, give us a sense of, of the scope of this problem. How many uh, American uh, servicemen and women and contractors might have been exposed to what was in these burn pits, the, the toxic uh, fumes and, and consequences? We're really trying to get to the bottom of that because uh, I should have said uh, early on that we think about burn pits, but there are also other potential toxic exposures that uh, could have just been where you were based. So not necessarily related to a specific operation. One of the things that I've suggested, I chair the personnel subcommittee on Senate Armed Services. I would like to make sure that the health record reflects the movement of a man or woman in uniform throughout the life of their active service, uh, whether it was a burn pit incident, whether or not they were somewhere where dangerous materials were being uh, transferred that they were in close proximity to. We need to capture that information now, even before they could exhibit any sort of healthcare consequences and maybe even get to a point to where we can predict that they need care even before the man, and woman, man or woman in uniform even understands or has any symptoms. That's the level of of granularity that we need to get to. That's gonna require us to go back and look at everybody, where they moved, our knowledge of where toxic substances could have potentially been, be, and make sure that that's all incorporated into their health chart going forward. So just to give our viewers some sense of the uh, magnitude of this, some journalistic estimates have put the number of people who may have been exposed to to toxic fumes or substances at these burn pits as high as 175,000. Don't know whether that figure is going to bear out, but it, it suggests that this is a, a significant problem. Senator, you said that you want to get ahead of this. Uh, unlike uh, other issues in the past, like Agent Orange, where we spent years, really decades, struggling to figure out compensation and liability issues, you want to do something right away about the health of these veterans. Maybe you could talk about your approach to dealing with, with the burn pit health healthcare problems. 
I should also say it's very personal to me. My wife's uncle uh, died from Agent Orange exposure. He was in combat in Vietnam. Um, it took decades to get to the point to where we were providing proper care and support for veterans of the Vietnam War. We cannot afford to take decades. The technology, the science, the information we have access to is something that we should be able to get done very quickly. We only got a lot of the presumptive illnesses for toxic substances at Camp Lejeune ultimately approved back in 2017. That's when, after I'd spent about three years my, uh, here in my tenure in the U.S. Senate trying to get done what Senator Burr and everyone else had been doing for years. We just got to get ahead of it. That's why we need an independent agency to really understand the, uh, the nature of the exposures, and then they can give us guidance on the population that was actually affected. But this is something that we should be talking about getting done in this Congress or the next Congress with the right information and getting ahead of this, because I actually believe if we do, we may be at a point to where the more acute conditions can be avoided by giving the presumption of care sooner. And we also have to work with the, the VA and the DOD to understand, look, if, if we identify an exposure we're not gonna give you an unfunded mandate that you have to work within your current budget. That's a part of the tug and pull that I've observed up here. Assume that with independent advice, we identify where we're responsible for the health and safety of service members and veterans. And then we, it's on us, Congress, to make sure you have the resources to provide the care. This should never be about money. This should be about providing care to service members and veterans. So, Senator, one of the interesting, uh, unusual things in uh, Washington that sometimes uh, seems kind of paralyzed uh, by division is the broad coalition that, that you've got working to advance uh, this idea of, of taking better care of, of veterans' health. Uh, the, the coalition, uh, as I understand it, is known as the Team Coalition. Tell us a little bit about the groups you, you brought together here. Well, I think this is remarkable, and they put down, uh, they've laid down a bill that we think is a great baseline for getting bipartisan support. The, the veteran service organizations work together a lot of times, but you know, frequently they have things that are at odds with one another. To have 30 veterans or service organizations come together with the team coalition is extraordinary. It's why I'm very, very optimistic that with that coalition, we can get the support we need in the Senate, and I'll defer to my House colleagues uh, in the uh, interview a little bit later, but I think we'll have strong support for it. Again, it's going to be science-based. It, it's, it's going to be based on scientifically driven recommendations for presumptions of illnesses that could have been caused by these, uh, by these exposures, burn pits or other toxic exposures, and then we just fast-track the uh, provision of care. Senator, I think it would interest our viewers if you just tell the backstory of your interest in this um, through Camp Lejeune uh, in, in your state and your concern about, about tainted water there that was causing s serious health problems and trying to get to the bottom of that. Walk us through that. Well, we got, in, uh, we got into the middle of uh, some of the internal experts at VA were taking a more conservative view about the presumptions. The, the presumptions basically are the trigger that provides care to those who were uh, potentially exposed. And we just decided that we wanted to flip the presumption. And one of the ways that we did that is we went to the CD CDC and other expert advisors who said there's a scientific basis for assuming that they were in Lejeune for a period of time, they were likely exposed, and for that reason, we should just assume that they, pro they should be provided care. Same sort of construct needs to work here with burn tip pits or any toxic exposures. And it's also important uh, to mention, particularly domestically or in foreign bases, that we have to include family members. So, you know, a part of what we focused on at Camp Lejeune is the exposure of family members and giving them the health care that they deserve. So when we cast that net and we try to find every incident that could have been a toxic exposure, it's not just burn pits in the Middle East or people who were uh, forward deployed in, in combat situations. It's also chemical exposures here at home, like Camp Lejeune. That way we're going we're gonna to cast a wider net and we're probably going to save a lot of lives in the process. So one, one takeaway for me, Senator, is your, your phrase, the presumption uh, of care. Let me just ask, uh, the, the burn pit, the toxic, toxic exposure problem uh, obviously affects the lungs in many cases. And we have now a pandemic that has terrible consequences 
for for lung compromised people. Do our veterans have have special uh, vulnerabilities to COVID nineteen because of some of these exposures you're trying to track down? Well, they could very well. Uh, uh, some of the um, uh, some of the reports that we've gotten uh, have it manifest itself in terms of respiratory distress. That's clearly an at risk indicator for COVID nineteen. Um, there's a number of other things that, uh, that just basically affect your immune response. There's a number of things that we need to get down to, but there's no question in my mind that at least with some of the reports we've gotten out of burn pits, we've, we've had a number of people report uh, before oversight committees that uh, their husband or wife came back with respiratory problems. That's a key risk factor in COVID-19. Um, that's why we have to accelerate it. You know, the, the, I, have to, I hate to, to get down the weeds, but I think it's so important. Whether it's the exposure to toxic substances, whether it's the the uh, the uh, repeated exposure to low-level concussive events that have been linked to traumatic brain injury and uh, PTS, these are the sorts of things that we need to get down get down right in the soldier's health record. I really want to get to a point to where we have the data to predict a risk before the the soldier, the serviceman or the veteran ever we would even expect that they're at risk. So it's not only making sure when you come to a VA facility or a DOD hospital that we have the presumption to provide you with care. I want to move it further up into the life cycle and try to find accelerated ways to identify and intervene long before these complications ultimately affect a service member. So, Senator, in the few minutes that we, we have left uh, in our conversation, I want to ask you about a couple of things that are in the news where I'm sure people would like to know your, your views. Uh, after the incident in uh, Lafayette Park and the clearing of streets by law enforcement personnel, you said you thought it was a time for cooling temperatures. Since then, we've had a lot of uh, senior uh, members of the military establishment, including the chairman of the Joint Chiefs, General Mark Milley, speak out uh, pretty forthrightly about a feeling that it was not appropriate for the military to have been involved in that, that it wasn't appropriate for General Milley to have been there in uniform. Just curious what your own thoughts are as somebody who cares, cares deeply about the, about the military and whether you'd share General Milley's concern. Well, I have a lot of respect for General Milley. The first time I met him was probably almost six years ago when he was head of force comm down at, uh, at Fort Bragg. I, uh, I think that he took an appropriate position when he went out there and said it was appropriate for him to be there. Look, the men and women sign up uh, to serve the United States um, to defend against foreign enemies. And I think that we found ourselves in a situation where we came close to where it would, uh, it would be an inappropriate use of the military. I mean, the, the uh, the Insurrection Act is there for a reason. If you look at the history, it was, uh, it was appropriately used even against governor's objections, dating all the way back to Ulysses S. Grant. But we have to use that judiciously because it could make future people who would like to serve in the military wonder whether or not they want to if they thought that the likelihood was high that they may actually be in a position um, uh, in, in a Washington, D.C. or a Los Angeles or a Seattle. So I think that we always have to be judicious with that. We have a National Guard. They do a great job. Uh, the governors can call them up. The president can work with these governors. I think that's the most appropriate course because I did not want to see the situation escalate. I wanted to see, I didn't want the yelling to drown out the legitimate grievances of those uh, who want to come together and figure out a better way uh, for law enforcement to, to uh, act responsibly. And I think you do that through dialogue. And it's not, ta you know, talk about it now and then forget about it. I seriously want a dialogue, and I'm looking forward to Tim Scott's bill that's going to be put out tomorrow. If you think about South Carolina and Tim Scott, couldn't be a better person leading the charge. They did something very differently when there was a mass shooting at a church and there was an officer-involved shooting. The governor and state leaders got together, they had dialogue, they had reconciliation, and they produced an extraordinary response. So I can't think of anyone else to put forth the proposal that I, I fully support. I'm an original co-sponsor, and I hope that we really do take these very, very difficult times and have something good come out of them. Senator, we have just a minute left, but I, I really want to ask you, you mentioned Fort Bragg in, in your home state. 
Um, and F Fort Bragg is, is one of the uh, U.S. military installations where there's been a call uh, by, by many people uh, for renaming uh, to take away the names of, of people who served the Confederacy. You said that you, you're not sh uh, supporting that, that, that change. Uh, I just want to ask you to explain where you are now on that question and, and if you think it shouldn't be, the name shouldn't be changed, uh, why? Well, I, I oppose the uh, the amendment that was that was offered by Senator Warren. Uh, keep in mind that her first version of the amendment included removing uh, grave sites or, or grave markers at Arlington National Cemetery. I just like to see a policy where it is forcing a discussion, where we talk about where we bring people together, but a mandate to simply uh, to rename every uh, camp every firing range, every plaque, every paraphernalia indiscriminately without a dialogue doesn't seem like it's really, um, I don't think it's well structured. I think we ought to be getting people together, talk about history, get the communities actively involved, uh, both on the base and in the communities that they're, uh, that they're positioned. That to me seems like a structure that produces greater dialogue, and a better outcome that everybody at either side of the issue would be more likely to embrace and move on. Well, Senator, it's great to have a chance to talk with you about all of these issues affecting both veterans uh, and our active duty military. Thanks for being with us today. We really appreciate it. Um, and we'll look forward to talking to you in the future. Uh, ahead, we're going to be talking with uh, comedian, legendary comedian, I, I want to say, John Stewart, who is also a, a veterans advocate. Uh, but first, before we turn to John Stewart uh, and uh, a colleague from the Wounded Warrior Project, I want to ask you to look at a video that the Wounded Warrior Project, our sponsor for today's event, has prepared, which I think will will show you some interesting things you may not know. Today we launched Operation Advocacy, which was really getting warriors from across the country to come in to Washington, D.C. and meet with congressional staff and congressional members. What I'm hoping to accomplish is just to open some legislators' eyes to the fact of like what we as veterans have had to suffer through. You can tell in the conversations that we're having, they're passionate, they're interested, they're asking questions. That alone makes me feel that they're listening to me. We're here obviously to represent our alumni, but the changes that the Congress is considering will help veterans of all generations. This is David Ignatius, a columnist of the Washington Post. I'm back with you again for the second segment of our three-part discussion of veterans' health issues. Uh, here with me in this segment, we have uh, Derek Fronenbarger, who is the Legislative Affairs Director, Government Affairs Director of the Wounded Warrior Project, which uh, is sponsoring this program, and John Stewart, the well-known, I said earlier, legendary uh, host of The Daily Show, who's also very active in veterans affairs uh, and has, has come to see this as a key uh, issue he wants to, to speak up about. John, if I may, I want to start with, with you. You uh, were active in trying to help 9-11 first responders and the health issues they had after that uh, tragedy. And in a similar way, it seems, you've decided to get involved in this issue. Tell us a little bit about why and why it motivates you to get to get into. Uh, so after uh, we, we worked uh, with a gentleman named John Field, the Feel Good Foundation, for many years uh, to try and address the health issues uh, post 9-11, uh, where first responders and the community were having a lot of difficulties with their health, but they were having to advocate uh, against the government who was not believing that there was a connection between the toxic uh, exposures that they had been faced on 9-11 and the health problems they were having now. And what we found is it's a very analogous situation to what the veterans are facing today with their not just the burn pit exposures, but all kinds of toxic exposures. So what happened was John Feel and I uh, were contacted by a woman named Rosie Torres from a group called Burn Pit 360. Uh, she had seen the work that had been done during the Zadroga Act, and she had been running this organization for a decade. 
her husband, Leroy, was deployed in Iraq. Uh, I believe he was uh, in Bilal. And when he was downrange, he was next to a 10-acre burn pit. And wouldn't you know it, when he came back, he is suffering from uh, a tremendous amount of, of lung and pulmonary issues directly related to uh, his burn pit exposures. He was a, a state trooper in, in Texas, I believe, and was unable to do some of the tasks that he needed to do as a state trooper because of the health conditions. So they had him resign. He's been fighting for years now for benefits based on the exposures that he received uh, uh, to the burn pits in Iraq. The Texas Supreme Court just declined to even take up his case. So you've got uh, thousands of veterans and their families in, once again, returning from war, facing a tremendous health crisis due to toxic exposures or traumatic brain injuries and having to battle their own government to get those conditions uh, recognized. So we felt like what had been done with Zadroga was a really good template. And so uh, what we did is uh, John and I reached out with Rosie's help to Senator Gillibrand's office and to Derek, and we put together that uh, coalition of veterans, uh, VSOs, dating all the way back to Vietnam to, to present day. We all got together uh, and, and met in Washington and had been meeting on a, a continued basis and had been planning on rolling out uh, what we felt were uh, appropriate legislative uh, remedies to these situations. Obviously, COVID and everything else has, has made it a lot more difficult. But I think what the team uh, is presenting now is a stopgap. And it will certainly help, and it will help save lives until we get, I think, what we need, which is presumption and, and a change in the way that we go to war. If you can't take care of uh, those that are injured and, and uh, face health issues from war, if we're going to make them fight our wars and then come home and fight for their lives, that, that has to change. That's just a model that has to change. So thanks for that. That's a powerful summary. Let me turn to Derek and ask Derek if he'd explain a little bit what John and Senator Tillis were, were talking about, about the presumption of care and how you'd like to see that uh, work in terms of legislation and really, I guess, the whole mindset of how our approach to veterans health care works. No, uh, David, that's a great question, uh, and thank you for that. Um, I think there's a misperception in the general public where if you're a veteran, you automatically have VA health care, and that's actually not the case. Uh, there is actually a very complex um, formula and process to actually get into the hospital at VA once you get out of the military. Uh, so when you get out, uh, generally what you have to do is you have to show that your injury or your illness or your disability was due to service. Uh, and that's not as easy as it sounds. Um, if, for example, you're missing your left arm, you can show the doctor when you're going through that process, it's called the CMP process, which can take anywhere between eight months to a year, that while you lost your left arm, here's the paperwork uh, from the military, and it's hard for them to say that that didn't actually happen while you were deployed. Um, the, the difficulty with rare illnesses and toxic exposure is you have an individual who was around a burn pit for two years, um, and they now have lung cancer, but while they're reviewing your file for the, the, the eight months to a year that it takes to approve or deny you, they notice that you also smoked for two years. So now there's no way to really know, was it the smoking or was it the burn pit that caused the cancer? Um, and unfortunately, what we're seeing is a lot of individuals are being denied access to healthcare because the barrier of entry is to set up that CMP exam and be approved um, for you to actually get healthcare. So what we were actually really pushing for, and if we had to sum up our message in, in one, one blip, it would be much to what John Stewart said, while we are looking at the compensation and disability exam process, we need to give healthcare to veterans to save their lives. Um, that is a misperception that everybody can just go and get healthcare. Um, and really we're, we're trying to, to be a little bit more proactive in saying, 
you shouldn't have a barrier of entry to try and live longer. Um, you, you really need to to be able to have that benefit, uh, that healthcare benefit, right off the bat if needed. And Derek, Derek let me ask you the, the same question I asked this Senator Tillis. That's a, a profound interest of vets around the country. Do vets who may have been exposed to these uh, burn pits, other toxic exposures, do they have a special uh, risk uh, of COVID-19? So I would say that, you know, scientifically, we're not sure if you're at a higher risk of contracting COVID-19 if you're around a burn pit. But I would say it, it would be a, not a big step to say if you have deteriorated lung capacity and you are then infected by the COVID-19 virus, that there is the possibility you'll have additional complications. Um, the team coalition did actually push forward uh, a letter um, to the Senate Armed Force uh, Committee um, to try and say if you're getting treatment for COVID-19 at a DOD base or at a VA hospital, they really should ask whether or not you were around a burn pit. That does two things. It starts tracking the issue of whether or not um, you are at a higher risk for complications, but it also gets the doctor and the veteran thinking about other alternatives and other things that they might not have thought about um, if you were affected. Um, so definitely, you know, I would recommend if you if you're at a high risk for COVID-19 and you're around a burn pit, you you should be proactive in letting your physician know that. So, uh, John, I uh, I much as we'd all like to pull you back into the days of the Daily Show, uh, no way. But I do want to ask you a little bit about politics. We're living through an incredible period of of disruption and and maybe of change. Uh, we've we've got this global pandemic. We have the most intense uh, contra uh, discussion and sometimes controversy about about racial justice issues that we've had in 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 many decades. What do you what's your sense of, of things? Is this a period where you uh, feel uh, hopeful about the direction we're going? Uh, is this a, a moment where you feel that uh, Democrats who were trying to uh, prepare for the November elections? Uh, have a clearly defined issues or need to do more definition? Uh, well, I, I'm always hopeful uh, for the country because I've, I've spent so much time with people like Derek uh, and people like Rosie Torres and people like uh, John Field of the Field Foundation who are the, the, the real advocates that are out there working on a day-to-day -day basis to improve the lives of uh, veterans and first responders and, and obviously for for all different issues and, and the different advocates, but you know, and I think uh, there'll certainly be plenty of time to, to discuss that. But I think what's difficult about the veterans issue is that so few people in this country serve. It's such a small percentage of the population, and their issues are oftentimes purposefully hidden from the general population. We're we've gotten really, really good in this country at saying we support the military and we put on the flag pin and we thank them for their service and we give them that 10 percent coupon at appetizers for chilies but the truth is structurally we have not done enough to address the wounds of war that they come home with whether they be brain injury uh pts uh, uh or these toxic exposures the system is set up to deny them the benefit. A great example, you know, when we're, we're talking about burn pits, one of the great delay methods is to say, well, we don't have the science yet. When are you gonna have the science? Well, we gotta study it for 20 to 25 years. Well, by then, a lot of these people will have died and their families will have been left without a, a, a provider, uh, without a caregiver, without a husband without a wife, without a son, without a mother, without a father. So uh, we don't, they don't have the time for that. And that's a delaying method anyway. For instance, what did they use in the burn pits to get rid of all these materials? They used jet fuel. Well, at the, uh, the World Trade Center, what burned those materials? Jet fuel. We have 20 years of science on what these toxic exposures did to the lungs and, and organs of the uh, first responders and construction workers and survivors uh, down at ground zero. The science is there. We deny them their benefits because of cost. 
And if we've got the money to go to war, we have to make sure we have the money to take care of people when they come home from war. So, John, before we leave this uh, part of the uh, segment, I just want to note you, you've you got a new movie coming out, The Irresistible, and, and you, you've got an interesting interview coming up in uh, yeah. a competing publication, The New York Times, uh, in their I'm magazine uh, coming up in a week. And in that interview, you say something really quite uh, interesting, which is that we should be careful about uh, blaming the police separate from the rest of society. You talk at one point about how the police act as a kind of border police between the separate parts of our country. Say a little more about that before we just end this this segment, if you would. Yeah, I mean, I appreciate that. It's it's an awfully complicated issue, and I'm I I, I don't necessarily feel like comfortable with this as a a, a forum to uh, address it. Perhaps we'll have a chance to talk about it again uh, at another moment. And I certainly do appreciate. Uh, the Washington Post and you uh, giving us a forum to try and address uh, these veterans issues. Um, so I'm I'm going to demur on that, but I but I do hope that we we have an opportunity in the in the proper way to uh, to really address it in a, a more in depth manner. But um, the only thing I'll say is, and, and uh, Derek, I think you know will agree. Derek's done an amazing job at bringing together uh, this incredible coalition. I mean, David, we're talking about veterans from the Vietnam era talking about the struggle that they faced with Agent Orange exposures and still having thousands and thousands of claims going in and maybe 70 to 80 percent of them being denied. This is still Agent Orange. And then you're talking about Gulf War syndrome and then you're talking about K2 and Lejeune and, you know, from for my mind, I, I would like to see uh, uh, you know, the people that profit off of war have to kick in for the people that suffer from the effects of it. So, and I, I know this is probably controversial, but I believe that in the way that oil and gas companies have to kick in a 10% contingency on spills, I think war profiteers should kick in a 10% contingency plan that so that Derek and the VSOs and the frontline uh, workers and veterans don't have to always come hat in hand begging for money because their brothers and sisters are still dying from the things that they saw and faced in in downrange war zones. That's that's so. Derek, John, you with me, Derek? Uh, as as we say in my business, I think that's the lead. Um, I want to thank you for joining us, uh, and Derek. Uh, we're going to be back with a third segment in which. We'll have uh, Congressman Ruiz, uh, who's a leader in the House of Representatives discussion of veterans affairs and a reporter who's broken some important stories about toxic exposure that probably are unfamiliar to, to our viewers. But first, we have another video that we want to present to give you a little bit of background before we move, move into the third segment. Thanks again to John Stewart uh, and Derek Frodebarger. Thanks for having us. Thank you. We knew there was stuff in the ground. We just didn't know it was toxic. I think everyone was exposed to, to some sort of radiation. There was a lot of dust, pools with stagnant water. Water, standing water, the signs that talked about the radioactive material and stay away. Don't get me wrong, the mission was great. I wouldn't trade my team for anything, but the place itself, the mud, the rain, the, the smell, the contamination. It's the most miserable place I've ever been. Now, years later, it's, it's eye-opening on how many other forms of cancers people are coming down with. And they were all stationed at K2. David Ignatius, back for the third segment of our special program on veterans health affairs. Uh, the, the documentary that you just uh, saw is part of a project by McClatchy News for an investigative series they've done called Stricken. And the lead reporter for that project is Tara Kopp, who's going to join us now. She's going to be joined as well 
by Congressman uh, Raul Ruiz, uh, who is uh, a congressman from California, prominent uh, uh, spokesman on veterans issues, and is also a medical doctor and is co-chair of the Congressional Burn Pits Caucus, which is trying to focus on the issue that we've been discussing over the last uh, uh, half hour. Uh, Tara, let me ask you to begin by taking us uh, into that extraordinary landscape we saw in the little bit of video. Uh, what is that place and what's the nature of the, of the hazard that American Special Operations Forces and others got exposed to? Sure, thank you so much for having us on and for being able to show McClatchy's important work on this issue. Um, so it's actually perfect that we follow John Stewart, who has been such a champion of the men and women who responded to the base at the World Trade Center, because the men and women who were then sent to go find the people who launched that attack were initially sent to a base called Karshi Khanabad in Uzbekistan. That base, a former Soviet and Uzbek base, was selected because it was just about 100 miles north of where Al-Qaeda and Taliban were uh, residing and they could launch airstrikes there. But the base was a toxic mess. Um, there was radiation. There were chemical weapons from its previous use. When soldiers walked on the ground, they would actually see a black goo rise up from underneath their, bo their boots. And there were pools, there were retaining pools around the base that uh, they glowed different co colors. So the soldiers actually called them the Skittles ponds. Now, what they didn't know was just how dangerous this base was, but the Pentagon did, and it knew very early. Uh, we obtained documentation that the Pentagon knew as early as October 2001 uh, that the base had been a storage for chemical weapons, that there was enriched, uh, potentially enriched uranium at the site. Um, they knew that when you dug into the soil, that black goo was basically an underground pool of solvents and fuels and everything that had just been dumped onto this ground for the last several decades. And that's where these soldiers lived from 2001 to 2005. And uh, Tara, have the soldiers experienced a significant health problems as a result of that uh, appalling exposure that you just described? They have. Um, not only did when they first came home, nobody knew what K2 was. And even today, when these veterans tell their VA caregivers, I served at Karshi Khanabad, they often get a blank stare. So initially, when these veterans started coming home and one of the very earliest deaths happened just two years after um, they first were sent there in 2001, and they would go and they would ask for help and they would be denied because either nobody knew about what was happening at this base or just how bad the contamination was, and there were no records. Um, so they had to start taking care of their own, and that's where we started to meet some of these service members. They formed a Facebook group, you know, slowly but surely they found other veterans who had served there and they vetted them. And as this has gotten more attention, more than 4,000 veterans have now joined this Facebook group. About 1,400 have filled out a survey saying whether or not they've experienced any sort of illness there, and more than 450 have reported some form of cancer. Powerful reporting. Uh, good for McClatchy for, for pressing it. I want to now ask uh, Congressman Ruiz to, to join our conversation. Uh, Congressman, you have been uh, a strong uh, proponent of doing something to take care of the uh, victims of, of burn pits in Iraq and Afghanistan. Uh, I understand that your uh, commitment on this issue stems in part from the experience of one of your own constituents, uh, Jennifer Kepner, who herself was exposed to burn pits. Maybe you could just tell us that story as a way of helping us to see this in, in more immediate and personal terms. Thank you, David. I first want to thank the Washington Post, uh, John Stewart as well, uh, Derek, Wounded Warrior Project, and uh, and it's great to see Senator Tillis' joint team. We've been working with VSOs uh, for years on this issue, and we're looking forward to move the ball forward with him in a bipartisan way. Uh, and it's great to, to share this segment with Tara and her excellent reporting. Uh, Jennifer Kepner had with me one of the most impactful kitchen table conversations that I've had as a congressman. I, I'm a physician, so I've dealt with life and death situation at the bedside. Uh, but 
Jennifer Kepner was telling me her experience of difficulties in getting care. She was a 39-year-old mother of two, uh, married, who served in Balad Air Force in Iraq, uh, was exposed to the fumes of these toxic burn pits, and then developed pancreatic cancer. She had no other high-risk factors. The physicians did a very thorough genetic study, a very thorough uh, history uh, of all of her exposures and concluded that the most probable cause of her pancreatic cancer was exposure to these fumes in these toxic burn pits. So months afterwards, after that conversation, she died. But her last words, and I was there at uh, her deathbed with her family uh, crying and, uh, and being part of, uh, of, of helping them mourn through their difficult loss. And her last two wishes were one, please help other veterans get the care and benefits that they need so they didn't experience what she experienced. And two, was to help her family because uh, she was leaving behind a widow uh, and uh, he was going to have to take care of his children. And so therefore, we worked very hard to get benefits for her widow uh, and also uh, have been leading the charge in the House of Representatives to really bring attention and actual change uh, with the issue of burn pits and to help our veterans get the, the care and the benefits that they need. So, Congressman, let me just ask the point that comes through to me from each of the conversations we've had so far. The Pentagon seems to have been slow to realize the seriousness of this problem. Is that your view? And what do you think the Pentagon needs to do to really get serious about these issues now? Absolutely. Right Very now. slow in realizing this. You know, the VA uh, keeps saying they need uh, uh, more proof in uh, their scientific studies. Well, the, the best study is a longitudinal prospective cohort study that can take 20, 30 years. And as John Stewart said, our veterans are going to die before they even finish that study from pancreatic cancers, autoimmune diseases, and very severe pulmonary illnesses. Uh, as an emergency physician and public health expert, we know that if you have a high enough suspicion that of a, an agent that causes a severe enough consequence, then you need to act on that suspicion now. And so we know through various studies that John Stewart had mentioned and others that there are carcinogens in the fumes of these toxic burn pit exposures. There are biopsies of veterans from their lungs demonstrating these heavy metals. You have uh, carcinogens in the dust and in the samples. So we know that there's a high enough suspicion of the association, and we have countless of veterans who are dying from uh, cancers, autoimmune disease, and severe lung diseases. So we need to do a four-pronged public health approach to this issue. One is we have to end the use of burn pit. I've successfully added amendments to appropriations that require the DOD to have an implementation of a phase-out plan to end the use of burn pits. The second thing we need to do is we need to educate the doctors and the veterans about the subtle changes in health due to the different illnesses caused by their exposure to burn pits so that they don't wait till it's too late before they get the care that they need. Third is we need to have the VA provide the care and the benefits uh, for the veterans and their families so that they can actually get the care. And then fourth, we need to do more research to fully understand the array of pathological consequences of, of and diseases of being exposed to burn pits. And that's what we're working on right now. I have a bill, the Veterans Right to Breathe Act, which would make nine pulmonary illnesses a presumption of exposure to these, uh, to the burn pits so that they can get the care and their families can get the benefits they need. I also have the Jennifer Kepner Hope Act, which would open up the VA for low cost care for anybody who needs a diagnostic workup, whether it's for cancer, autoimmune diseases, pulmonary illnesses, who have been exposed to burn pits. So uh, Tara, in the minute or so we have left, I wanna ask you to talk for a moment about another piece of important reporting that you're working on about the possibility that military pilots may have uh, increased uh, cancer risk uh, because, because of exposure that, that they may have in the cockpit. Tell us a little bit about that and what's being done to try to make that uh, a veteran's health issue uh, like the ones that we've been talking about. 
Sure, but before that, I'd just like to add that right now, the men and women who served at K2 cannot register on the VA's burn pit registry. K2 in Uzbekistan does not exist as a location where they're eligible to register. And so basically they're invisible. So if you want to be able to count how the burn pits have affected them too, they need to be able to be added to that registry. Um, the pilots, you know, we've talked over this seminar about the, the wide range of toxic exposures that can make someone sick, whether it's PFAS or the stuff that they saw at K2. And for pilots, it, they think it's possibly the radars and the different types of radiation that they were exposed to that was emitted from these radars during thousands of flight hours. We've been able to break several stories about the number of pilots who have been diagnosed with cancer. Um, it is, the Air Force is now looking at a groundbreaking study to finally study all aviators going back to 1970 to see if they have a higher rate and maybe were diagnosed at a younger age for some of these different types of cancers. And our reporting has led to Representative Elaine Luria uh, introducing a bill to have all of the services start to look at their aviators and see whether or not there's some tie, what has caused the number of cancers that these pilots are now seeing. So powerful reporting again. I wanna thank uh, Congressman Ruiz, uh, Tara Kopp, and all of the guests uh, on today's discussion of veter veterans health issues for joining us and talking about issues that are important, uh, about which we know too little. Uh, thanks to all of you. Uh, we'll be back at Washington Post Live on Thursday uh, with a discussion with YouTube uh, CEO Susan Wojcicki. And on Friday, our discussion of race in America continues with Lonnie Bunch, who is the secretary of the Smithsonian Institution. Uh, we hope you'll join us for that discussion, which should be powerful. You can come uh, join us at Washington Post Live uh, often uh, for the series of, of conversations. Thank you for being with us today.